And we're back, team, for another podcast. How we? How is everyone? We've got a, we've got a guest today. We've managed to find a guest, <laughs> as I've said for the past few weeks. <laughs> Me and Hayden have been here by ourselves, uh, and we've managed to get a good guest this week. Um, and we'll introduce him shortly. Uh, Hayden, how you been? I'm good, mate. Sorry, everyone, for that terrible introduction that Ryan just did. That it's kind I just of like went wild. It's it's kind of like you just had a mind blank for like five <laughs> seconds, just completely forgot. <laughs> everything you were meant to be doing it's like where am i what am i doing yeah, well it, it feels we, i mean we had two weeks off and then we've come back and then i just kind of felt a little bit we're back know, strong than ever uh mate i'm all good thank you uh I'm, i've had a good week to be fair in terms of like more uh personal uh side of things because uh I had the amazing news that for those that don't know i'm planning on a kind of like a five to six month trip to bali uh next year and it's been a bit up in the air for the last, I mean, a good year because it doesn't seem to be looking like actually anything's going to open up. And then Bali has been hit massively with like, obviously they've, they run on tourism, but they just yesterday uh, announced the visas has opened up again, Business so visas. which is incredible. So, you know, we've started the ball rolling and uh, we've messaged a few places because what's going to happen is especially everyone over in America or even uh, Australia more like, as soon as the borders open, everyone's going to want to go to Bali. So we were like, right, we need to be hot on getting our accommodation sorted. So we messaged a few people and prior to um, earlier in the year, if you messaged someone from like Airbnb or wherever, you could not, it was impossible. Like they were like, I don't even know if I'm going to have a house in six months. So I can't, I can't sell you it. I can't let you rent it. So nowhere was taking bookings. And it was kind of like, you know, when you feel like you're in limbo and it's like, am I going? Am I not going? I don't know. So we've, uh, yeah, we've put deposit down on a place. So if it's feeling real now. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Decent, excited. Man. Mate, you're, for those of you that watch on YouTube, you can actually already see our guest uh, on the screen. <laughs> so you can, you can wave, Alan. Um, I mean, that's exciting. Bali is incredible. We're, we're, before we go ahead and start chatting absolute rubbish, as we always do for the first five minutes of the podcast, let us introduce our guest. So he's not kind of standing there like a bit of a nah, We'll leave him here just to listen. <laughs> let us just introduce... in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to introduce Alan. So Alan is a... I'd say you're a friend of ours now. Um, oh, you. Alan is, you've just been upgraded to friend. Uh, Alan is a friend of ours. I'll pay, I'll pay the five pounds after the podcast. Um, and Alan, I'm going to let Alan tell you what he does because I don't want to absolutely butcher it for the guys listening. So Alan, introduce yourself. So I'm Alan. Um, I do a range of things, but most importantly, I think it's really about helping people to really discover who they are and unlock those things inside of themselves from a mindset perspective to create change and this was based out of, of my own journey and, and my life and that's really what it boils down to whether it's a personal transformation a business transformation a fitness transformation it's about unlocking those keys inside of ourselves to really move forward and, and that's what that's what i'm all about i think uh you have an incredible podcast voice i'm gonna say i think you're i think i think you're you're gonna because alan has also just released his own podcast um, and I think you're going to go a long way with it. Keep mm. that voice up. And uh, if if you're interested in Alan's podcast, because what is your podcast on? Mindset, business. Yeah. So you, you didn't butcher what I do, but you butchered the name of my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, I remember. Uh, so it's it's money, mindset and marketing. So it's basically looking at things uh, from, I suppose, a mindset perspective in all of these areas. But when you're looking to create change in life, those are the three areas. And some people are going to go, oh, well, marketing is not important to me because I don't run a business. But think of marketing in a different way, as in how do you market yourself? Like, how do you go find friends, a partner? How do people perceive you in the outside world? So the podcast is on all major platforms. We are pending on Apple. But we're, we're on all other platforms. For a little while as well. Pending, yeah. For I think another week or so. Mm. But if you search my name, so A W L A N Miles, as in the distance, uh, I'll pop up and subscribe. Listen, we've got some great guests planned. Maybe I'll return the favor and invite you to one. Oh, nice. Well, we'll put the link to Alan's show in case any of you want to check it out um, down below in the podcast description. Um, it's the least we could do to help you out, even though you have just advertised yourself thoroughly. Uh, so apologies for that, guys. It has been an advertisement in five minutes, but nonetheless, we're here. So well, the the like, I think even though, you know, Alan has a I don't know if you said it, you actually have a 
you've been inside fitness as well, haven't you? Like you yes. do, you have been inside a fitness business and um, you've also been on your own personal journey. And that's like one of the kind of main reasons why I wanted to bring you, bring you in because you've had such an incredible journey. Um, and I also find it like so fascinating to like hear almost the main reasons to why you started your um, fat loss journey in the first place and how like on reflection you know you've got to where you were so talk to us a little bit about kind of your journey with your own weight rather than anything else to start off with yeah so my journey with weight I was always I was, I was always a fat kid at school let's just be blunt about it like I was that kid who was bullied from quite an early age I remember being in year seven of secondary school and that transition, I think, from primary school to secondary school is a brutal one if you're not a popular kid. At this point, I hadn't yeah. discovered sport. So I was basically just the fat kid in the corner with a few geeky mates. Sorry to the guys who I went to school with. <laughs> I hung around with the year seven. Listen to this like, kids, man. <laughs> <laughs> I remember coming home one day and my mum counted. I had 37 bruises. And this kid had just decided to just tee off on me. And because of my upbringing, I was very much against violence. And I just stood there and took it. We didn't, we didn't cry or anything. We just took it and then wandered off. And I think I approached life a lot like that. The Life just used to kick the shit out of me most of the time. And I just take it. Um, and it wasn't until I became an adult that I really wanted to do something about my weight. So I got into sport as a kid eventually. And I was still a big kid. But where I grew up, we played a lot of rugby. So that was, that was seen as a benefit. I was a, a front row forward in rugby, so I needed to be big. Um, so that was always my excuse as to why I ate so much. I, it really never dealt with the issues. It wasn't until I became an adult and I was about to become a dad um, that I really realized there was a problem. And there was one pivotal moment for me that I'll always remember that really was the linchpin that started to create change. And it was... I remember um, the mother of, of my, my first child, so I've got five kids, but the mother of my first child, Landon, um, she said to me, so hard putting your shoes on when you're heavily pregnant. Like when you bend over to put your shoes on, it kind of wins you a little bit because you've obviously got a baby, like nearly at full term, sat on the front of your stomach. And I was like, oh my God, that's basically how it feels like when I put shoes on. And I was like, I'd bend over to try, try and tie my shoelaces up and I would hold my breath because I couldn't breathe if I bent over. And added to that, I then lived in a townhouse. So we had two, two flights of stairs. I couldn't run both, both flights. I was in a really, really bad way. And I said to myself, like, I have to do something. And this then ties all the way back to one of my earliest memories, which was me and my dad. I have a handful of memories with my dad. He died in a, in a motorbike accident before I was five. And I had spent my whole life wanting to be a dad. Here I was at the moment that I'd waited my whole life for into my mid twenties. And I was about to completely ruin it in my mind. I was going to be that failure of a father and I wasn't going to die in a motorbike accident, but I was just going to die because I like cake too much. And I was like, this is terrible. And it was that moment that really drove me to start to make change. And it was, it was not a linear journey. Like it was a messy, messy process to start off with of, the normal things you, you read the marketing material don't you you see tony horton like with p90x like jumping around eating yeah. a lettuce leaf smashing five kilo dumbbells into the ceiling and you're like oh, i'm gonna go do this you start doing that and then before you know it you feel like you're starving to death and i would literally wander to the the fridge i'd open the door and just stand there staring at everything being like what can i eat what can i eat what can i eat i can't eat any of it oh god and you would either shut the fridge or you would just break and you would just eat. Like, and there was points I'd wander to the fridge with a knife and just cut chunks of cheese off and secretly eat. And so it started to actually build a really negative habit. And I went through loads of different things. Keto wasn't really a thing uh, when I lost weight, but the Dukan diet was, which is basically the same thing. So we went through that, through P90X. I remember <laughs> I tried using exercise as a big mechanism. So using Billy Blanks, which is like Tybo. So it was like aerobics crossed with kickboxing in the middle of my lounge. Intense. You can imagine a five foot nine, nearly 300 pound man jumping around doing <laughs> aerobic kickboxing. <laughs> if only your neighbors could see. Yeah, well, I lived in a flat at the time. So I'm sure the people <laughs> below me really liked me. <laughs> but it was this, 
it was this journey of in the moment it was savage but it wasn't until I actually started to surround myself with people who I could look up to I didn't really realize what I was doing at the time and it was a case of one of my best friends was a he ended up at the time I didn't know him until he became obviously my friend but he ended up he was an ex-professional bodybuilder and the guy literally looked like he was chiseled out of granite um he was like he was Iranian so well, he is Iranian because he's still alive and it's that <laughs> thing of that's their their upbringing like it's a case of chicken and rice is standard food every day so and he was explaining to him you get to this age where all of a sudden your body just explodes when you're allowed to pick up weights and I started listening to him and I started listening to kind of how he was approaching things and it wasn't until I started to piece a few more people around me and then I invested in myself and started to understand okay like how can I find a way to ultimately have my cake and eat it because one of the things that happened on the journey for me was um you start to lose weight obviously but like eventually you start to find a way to lose some weight and then it becomes this interesting journey of mindset like and mindset was something that I was very I was a very pessimistic person I approached life quite negatively and I think a lot of that was due to some of the things that I'd gone through and I'd always said I was never going to let my life define who I was but I think in a, a way it kind of had to that moment kind of defined me and it wasn't until I started to really look at who I was and what I wanted to achieve and how I wanted to be seen by the world that I actually started to make a change because I truly believed that I had this big purpose and which was become a, a great dad, be that dad that could run around, play with his kids, throw them in the air, be like Superman. And I think every dad wants to be like that. And every mum wants to be like that to some degree. And it's that it was that thing of, okay, well, if I can achieve that, then everything will be fixed. But all of a sudden, here I was like 50, 60 pounds down in weight, maybe a little bit more. And I would look in the mirror and I still just saw this fat dude staring back, like a guy that I had no respect for, that I didn't like, that I was surprised anyone else liked, especially the opposite sex. And I was like, how can this be? Like people around me are telling me I'm doing a great job. Like I've dropped two clothes sizes already, if not three, but yeah, I still feel like crap. And it wasn't until you start to address the mindset side of it that everything starts to fall into place. And it's really the glue that kind of, in my opinion, anyway, it's the glue that pulls everything together because you can do all the right things to lose the weight. But in my experience, the thing that I see that is prevalent in a lot of people who are systemically struggling with weight loss, it's a mindset thing. Like ultimately, you could find a way to be happy being big, but there's always a degree of vanity. Like being able to, and I think it sometimes ties back, and I don't know what you guys think about this, but it sometimes ties back to, think of it, I was the kid at school who looked to the popular kid, that kid who could basically eat whatever he wanted, do whatever he wanted. He had a six pack just by waking up and all the girls flocked to him. And in, in, then you read magazines, the front cover of Men's Health, the front cover of Muscle and Fitness, the front cover of Flex or whatever, any magazine always had a semi-naked man well, depending on what shelf sometimes a fully naked man <laughs> on the front of it and um, other ones Hayden buys <laughs> <laughs> and and it was a case of this message gets drummed into you I know it's the same for women with when they look at the cover of their magazines so there gets a point where vanity does kick in right and it's, it wasn't until quite later in the journey that I decided that yeah I want to be in shape but I don't really care if I have a six-pack or not like I'm eating pizza and I can be in shape without having a six pack. Um, and it's that thing of really understanding who you are and, and what you want to achieve. Um, that, that, and that's really kind of the basis behind my journey. Like becoming a dad was a, a massive motivator for me, but that single mechanism on its own wouldn't carry me through. Like you ha I had to set much smaller goals along the way to kind of push me to that next level, to push me through that next bit of pain, to push me over the next hump. Because through my weight loss journey, several things happened that I think I could have used as excuses as to why I didn't continue. So, and these also play into why mindsets became a real passion of mine. Um, not only did I see it transform my life, but then as I got more involved in the topic, I saw how it could have changed other people's lives that I love and, and, and have lost. And I think 
that journey is one that was hard, but it's one that I'm glad it, it went the way it did. I'm glad that I had the struggles that I had because it's those things that when you come through the other side, like your adversity ultimately builds a level of toughness that allows you to go on and succeed. And I know, and I can say without a shadow of a doubt, my life is the way it is right now. And I love my life because of that journey. Mm -hmm. I ultimately, and it's, it's sometimes it can feel brutal and unfair because life is unfair. Let's be honest. Like life is unfair. Bad things happen to really good people and good things happen to really bad people. Sometimes that's just how it is. Like, but how we view that and it comes back to mindset doesn't it how we view that the perception of that situation determines in my opinion how you move forward because uh, you can either use those things those moments of adversity to destroy you or to raise you up and really drive you forward i don't know what you guys think about it yeah no you're hundred like going back to like the whole uh, just take a huge step back now to the marketing side of things when you talk about it and it's like what i find really interesting is so I like a, a similar thing to like I kind of was overweight my like my whole life like my whole life I was always always overweight and like always people would make like comments I think um people would always make comments but I think I was fortunate enough to maybe be in that like uh social group at school that you know I, I didn't get bullied as much um but it fascinates me how and you you kind of think back like throughout my whole like school years like I knew I was overweight I knew I was bigger than all of my mates and stuff like that but why didn't I care then like why what what was going on why didn't I take action then and then you you go back to like the marketing side of things and I think it's because for me like I can openly say like the my first initial like reaction to why I wanted to lose a ton of weight to start off with was because I realized I was starting to get to the age where like you know girls were becoming more interesting and I was the marketing perception, like Johnny Bravo, like all of these things you think of is like, you have to look a certain way for girls to be interested in you. And I think that was the first initial um, thing that got me into like kind of the weight loss journey. But like you said, tying this into the mindset, it was like, you ultimately realize that's not what makes you happy because you, you think, oh, if I have a six pack, I'll be happy if I have this, I'll be happy. But then you, you get closer to that mark and you're more miserable than ever or whatever it is. Like you realize that doesn't define your success or anything like that. So why do you think like, even though you were getting bullied through your whole like school years and stuff like that, why weren't you taking action then? Why was it a case of having to see like, um, sorry, was it your girlfriend at the time you say? Your wife? Uh... Partner? Yeah. So, it, yeah. So it was my, yeah, my partner of the time. Um, yeah. It was that moment. And I suppose the thing for me, like the reason I didn't make a change at that point in life was food was my friend. Like food was, um, it was an emotional journey. Like, I, And I think this is one of those things that emotional eating, and this is, I've had loads of really interesting conversations with my wife about this because she's never struggled with her weight ever. She's always been the like perfect size eight, like had a very different journey through school to me. And it was a case of, I talked to her about, talked to her about emotional eating and she was like, is that even a thing? Like, so what, you just eat ice cream when you're sad? I'm like, no, I'm not Rachel Green from Friends. Like, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> and it's this thing of when, and this is, this, I discovered this actually whilst I was um, doing some studying and it was a case of anything that you learn before the age of eight, so any kind of mindset habit or pattern that you learn before the age of eight, it ingrains itself into you and you cannot remove it. You can manage it and you can mitigate it, but you cannot remove it. And obviously, like I said at the very beginning, my dad passed away before I was five. That was a pivotal moment in my life, obviously because I lost my dad, but more importantly, because how my mum showed me love, obviously she gave me hugs and kisses, but she showed me love through food. So what I mean by this is I'd come home from school every day to freshly baked cakes. I'd come in from playing football on the weekend with my mates and she'd have cooked a whole roast dinner just for me with a big pudding. And it was that process of it. Your brain then clears that pathway that if you're sad, food will make you happy. If you're happy, celebrate with food. If you want, if you feel lonely, go and eat something. So even on my weight loss journey at the beginning, think of, of what I said, I would go and stand and stare at the refrigerator. I'd go stand with my friends. 
and go like anyone want to come play and jump in my mouth like and it's that thing <laughs> it's that oh, this thing got a podcast, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> that's a soundbite right there <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and anyone would and it, that's the thing isn't it you look at that journey and the emotional eating side of the journey was fundamental so at that point when i was being bullied i'd seek comfort in food i'd go to the cafeteria at lunchtime and I would go get a cheeseburger and I'd be like, I'll be all right. Everything's fine. And it wasn't until um, year 11 where I, I became head boy, like what a wanker. Like I was head boy. <laughs> and it was that moment where I could finally get a bit of control. I could take back control and I could throw people out of buildings at lunchtime. Like I could start to, and it sounds narcissistic and I suppose it is a little bit, but it was a case of I could finally be in a place of having some control over my journey at school, but food was always my crutch for it. And I think for a lot of people that that emotional side of it gets overlooked massively because emotional eating isn't just a negative thing. Like you can be excited, you can be happy. Think of it, someone's birthday. What does everyone do? Go out for dinner. Mm -hmm. Like it's an anniversary. what do you do? Go out for dinner. <laughs> like it's the same thing, isn't it? So your brain learns and it's just some people rely on that happiness much more than others. Um, and it's, yeah, that's what I think. And I think it is true, isn't it? It's not until you then have a bigger motivator. So, I mean, obviously I tried to do things around maybe losing weight before that, but they were never really serious commitments. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a case of, oh, I should maybe be a bit careful. Like my mum put me on a diet at points and it was like, okay, I'll eat the salad today, but can I have apple crumble for pudding? Yes, Alan, you can. All right, thanks. And mm -hmm. it's, it just mitigates it. So, uh, yeah, I, I, from my perspective, I think emotion plays a big role um, inside of people's decision to not take action. Love that. So give us a little, uh, give us an insight into how much you lost. So um, at my biggest, I weighed just under 300 pounds and I got down to at my absolute thinnest, uh, I was 175. So uh, is that so what, like 100 and that's that 150? You want just kilos? Under? Let me have a look. Uh, let me just calculate it. I'm terrible at remembering numbers. Twenty-five so, pounds. So it's like sixty kilos. So what, like, what nine stone? Yeah, about nine stone. I lost in total. So and I so since that point, so that was about eleven years ago that I got down to uh, that I really started the journey. I I have gained back about ten to fifteen pounds. That's my fluctuation point. So I sit very comfortably around that like. 185 to 190 ish mark mm -hmm. um and that's where the, that's the point where i can really enjoy life I, I don't have to worry like exercise is part of what i do but that that comes back into more of a mindset thing and like i think it comes down to having the right structure for your day and being able to create clarity and control but yeah so i lost over 100 pounds in weight and it created such gigantic change in my life not just from a uh, how I looked perspective or a clothes perspective, but also from the perspective of how people interacted with me. And like, this is, this is the thing I think that shocks me the most. And it's, it's pretty bad actually, I suppose, how the human race is, but people who wouldn't talk to me before now would talk to me. I'm still the same person. Maybe I was more confident, but I was still the same person. If you got to know me, I, I've not changed I'm a personality transplant, but it's that thing of, because unfortunately, like people judge a book by its cover and that in turn makes you judge yourself even more. So it's a knock on effect. So yeah, I've lost over a hundred pounds in weight. It transformed my life from a work perspective, personal perspective, obviously a health and fitness perspective. Um, and like life is, is very different uh, at this point. Still love food. Like, Absolutely, hammer a pizza given an opportunity. Um, can clear a tray of ice cream in under fifteen minutes, uh, like, and it's it's those kind of things that uh, it's important to discover who, what's important to you and who you are. And I'm quickly sorry. I'm, I'm just interested to see what what you say about this. So, just going to challenge you a little bit with okay. what you said about the, um, you know, you said people start looking at you differently. Do you think people start looking at you differently? Or do you think because you've lost all this weight, you've gained this mass amount of confidence, your outlook has changed and you respond to those conversations differently now? The reason that I say that 
is because I see it quite a lot in um, when people are losing weight and stuff and I see their confidence build and I see it stuff like prime example, I had uh, a friend that uh, in the nicest way possible, like lost control slightly of his nutrition and stuff and, and gains all his weight. He became a very, very, very different social person in, in uh, like in certain scenarios than he was when he was lighter. You could 100% see that he had lost a mass amount of confidence and conversations that I'd normally just have with him. Like I wouldn't, and again, like, again, like I, I guess I'm kind of like, this is a specific scenario and it might not be the case for everyone, but like the conversations that I would have with him um, after he'd gained all of this weight were exactly the same, but his responses were very, very different. And what I mean by that is like, he wasn't really engaging in conversation. Like it wasn't like, I don't know. It was almost like this because he had like created this shell of um, a lack of confidence in himself that he wasn't engaging in the conversations the same as he was prior. And then he actually lost a ton of weight again. And people used to say, so-and-so is back. And I, I find it, I've always found it really fascinating. Cause I'm like, what, what was the situation there? Like why, with that confidence like what happened so i'm just interested to see like do you actually think that people did look at you differently or do you think your just reactions were different yeah i think it's some and some i think obviously you're going to interact in a situation differently i can think of a few situations very specifically where people who wouldn't entertain even having a conversation with you especially of the opposite sex now we're going like they were clambering over like bodies to to have a conversation with hey, Alan. <laughs> exactly. And it was this thing of, well, this is interesting, like uh, seeing these things happen. But there are, and this is something that um, I was really surprised about. I spent a lot, obviously, a long period of, of my working career inside of recruitment. So we would look at studies. There are actual studies that show that, and obviously you can't discriminate against people when you're hiring for a job, but actually we subconsciously select people who are in better shape than people who are who are not so when you're looking for somebody to work in a call center the hiring managers without unless they were incredibly conscious of who they were hiring their first reaction was to actually hire the person who was in better shape which shows our predisposed judgment that and there's nothing against the person who is can maybe overweight but it's and they might have a far better skill set but it's a case of it's that's the ancestral but evolutionary thing isn't it like when we're looking for a mate this is why teenage girls and teenage boys it's why the popular kids generally speaking not completely because some of them aren't always the ones in shape but think of any movie most high school situations that you can think of in real life the popular kid is the kid who's a, like, especially from a boy's perspective, girls go after the boy who's a little bit dangerous, a little bit unpredictable, and generally always in fairly good shape because it's yeah. just an, it's an evolutionary thing. Like that's who to look for. Look for the mate who's going to be able to take care of you, who makes life exciting, and who is in half decent shape. Yeah. And it's not until you get, and I actually said this to myself, right? This is the saddest thing, I think. I, this is a, a core belief I used to have growing up. My time will come when I hit my 40s. Everyone will want Alan when he's in his 40s because everyone wants a reliable man at that point. That's what I truly believe going through my teenage years. Like my time will be... Long time to wait. <laughs> <laughs> my time will be in my 40s. So, and this sounds terrible, but take what you can get until then. Make yeah. the best of it. And Find think, the goodness in people. It's the word that's put... But it, 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 like, what, What's a typical word that you associate with someone that is deemed as a fat person? Lazy. Yeah. So instantly it's like, what do you not want an employee? Laziness. So that stereotypical of like, oh, you're fat, you're obviously lazy, you don't work hard, you're not driven. Like it's gonna get ill. Yeah, so all these negative connotations that get put with that when actually the body composition makes jackal difference really to that. But actually, if you probably put everyone in a line who was maybe carrying body weight, you might find some uh some similarities in personality traits like actual scientifically wise but society wise we've assigned them already we assume that if someone is out of shape it's because that they're lazy they can't be bothered that they don't care about that so as an yeah. employer you'd probably be like well they're not the traits that i want from that standpoint as well but it also goes from the same as like people that are in shape and better looking are more likely to it was something like a stat of like certain jobs were like you're more likely to get employed because of the the likability basically like the you, physical likability 
Yeah, you are. If you are better looking, you are more likely to have a reduced um, sentence in prison, like on trial. Like it's actually like a, a study. Yeah. Who's up for a bank job? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's do it no I, com- I actually yeah i know like hearing your response like, i completely agree like you do 100 percent. like it's it's awful but i think we do as human beings create this um association with some stuff like again uh, I, you hear it all the time don't you like you see someone that is overweight and stuff like you don't know the, do- the cards they've been been dealt you don't know their background and stuff but you probably make an mm. assumption that they don't care about them they don't care about their health yeah, yeah. Yeah. um so yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree, you agree with that and it's so, just oh, i was gonna say it's, it's it, it is tough and it, it it it's how it is and and you're so right is it's like it's seen as as being overweight is this it's a societal thing that's yeah that's that's not accepting that it's given this kind of um yeah just whole negative connotation around it i think in every aspect from school like even as kids the fat kids are bullied. The fat kids don't have as many friends. Like it, it, it literally starts from a very young age. We we learn this and no one teaches you that you need to be nasty to someone who has a higher level of body fat. Like no one teaches you that. You just ultimately learn it from a very young age that those people that are like, you know that like you shouldn't be overweight. It's almost like it's an ingrained thing. You know, as a child, like you shouldn't be carrying excess body fat as a kid. But mm. no one teaches you that, or you know, do our parents? Well, it's that, it's that, it's that programming, it. isn't it? It's the programming that we receive that nobody teaches us. But when we're watching cartoons as boys and girls, well, what's Barbie? Like Barbie's yeah. in fantastic shape. What's Captain America? Fantastic shape. Even Hulk, like fantastic yeah. shape. Yeah. Absolute mutant yeah. of a man. Like that, and that's the thing. It's that, that subconscious programming. All superheroes are yeah. in shape all of them every single one of them even the ones who are human think of it from this way i'm a proper i'm a proper geek around like marvel and that kind of stuff think of what's his name hawkeye the guy with a bow and arrow he's just a normal guy with a bow and arrow but he's he could shape. be fat but he isn't yeah yeah <laughs> but, but mr mr incredible i argue that he looks a little bit on the flumptuous side sometimes <laughs> in certain angles i'm like oi <laughs> you mr blobby was my hero mr blobby was amazing was, yeah <laughs> But again, um, he was this blobby. fat Mr. Blobby <laughs> that was this larger than life. And that's, that's pretty normal, isn't it? Like, like a lot of people that are carrying excess body fat that are fat with the younger are larger than life characters because they put on this persona that they can hide behind. Their insecurities come from that. If I can make people laugh, it takes away the fact that I don't look how perhaps society deems I should look. And I take the attention away from me being ryan the fat kid to ryan the funny kid and people like having people that are funny around them you know you know the fat kid that wasn't funny they would get bullied the fat kid that was funny well they'd probably still have a shed ton of friends Mm. yeah Yeah. so how did this um how did this then because like we touched up on the at the beginning you started to get more into the fitness scene didn't you yeah so what was kind of the transition into that for you like how did that come about so, yeah, the transition what, into actually doing the fitness coaching side of things. Yeah. Yeah. So the transition for me, it came as a moment of um, actually creating some freedom. So I'd been in standard like white collar work my whole life. I, like, was, I left school at a very young age, left school at 16, didn't go to college, just wanted to go earn money. Um, we're a fairly entrepreneurial family. Um, and I just went and, and grafted and then I, I eventually changed careers, moved into recruitment, owned an agency and it was doing great. But it was this thing of at this point I had a family and I never saw them. I, and it was that thing of you'd come home and you'd be like, oh, I have to spend time with the kids. Oh, well, they're just about to go to bed. OK, well, I'll do it on the weekend. You'd wake up on the weekend and you'd be like, could everyone just leave me alone? I'm tired. Like, yeah. And it, you ended up in this vicious cycle. So fitness actually gave me a, a route out of what I was doing. Um, it allowed me to have some freedom, but it also allowed me to work on something that I was truly passionate about because I'll be frank, I hated recruitment. I spent 15 years in the industry, but I, it just, it wasn't really me. Um, but it was something that delivered a a great standard of income. Um, quite a young person's game, isn't it? Yeah, it can be yeah. like it's a bit of a uh, it's a bit of a dick measuring competition a lot of the yeah. time. Yeah, because uh, I know someone that is, I know a few people that do it, and it very much is 
a lot of them are like you know latest like 35 so under 35 they go out most days even for just after work drinks there's a lot of like who can earn the most who got the most commission and stuff like that and cars and watches and suits and i'm just like yeah yeah and there's some of that that i I found interesting and i think everyone enjoys it for a while but it got to a certain point and I just, I'd be sat at these events and you'd go to a conference or whatever. And it'd be well, a, a conference. Basically it's just a, like a, a free night in a hotel, a free bar. And then maybe they'll talk about work for 10 minutes and yeah. you'd look around the room. And I was just like, these are not my people anymore. Like this just mm-hmm. isn't me. Um, like I'm Alan, the, the dad, I'm Alan, the person who likes helping people. And at this point I was already helping people with fitness on the side completely for free. Um, but one of the things that I think a lot of us learn is people who pay, pay attention. People who get things for free generally, genuinely don't pay attention because you don't see the value in it. And mm-hmm. it was that thing of wanting to take that next step and be able to create a bit of freedom inside of life, but actually feel good about what I was doing and creating change. And I think I believed at such a core level that my health and fitness journey had created a massive change for me that um, I wanted to help others achieve it because I didn't think it was possible at, at a point. I didn't set out on day one and go, I'm going to lose over a hundred pounds in weight because it's just not possible. And I remember the moment that I discovered it, I was like, Oh my God, I've lost over a hundred pounds. Wow. And that became the, the thing. Uh, and for me, it was always a, wow, I lost over a hundred pounds. And, and it was almost a party trick. Here's my before and after. And people are like, it's not even you. I used to look like Phil Mitchell. I uh, and I'm a fat Phil Mitchell. Sorry, Phil Mitchell. You're not fat. <laughs> and it's um it's it was something for me that transition really came uh at a point where it allowed me to have a bit more freedom inside of life. And it was from there that I then started to discover that mindset was the the thing for me. It was great helping people around nutrition and it was great helping people around exercise. But I would then look at the coaches who really excelled at that and I'd be like that's not my thing. Like I can do it and I'm happy to do it, but there's only so many times you can, I could correct somebody's eating or correct somebody's exercise before I was like, this isn't lighting me up. Like I thought it would. And it was the mindset. It was about being able to literally open the top of somebody's brain and look at what's going on inside of it and be able to give them practical uh, steps to be able to fix things. Because I considered psychology for a while and I was like, but I don't want people laying on a couch next to me telling me that all their their problems and then us talking about theory i want to be able to give you some practical steps to be able to make a change right now because i'm a big believer the faster we take action the faster we can see a change um Mm -hmm. because procrastination is the worst thing because it's the biggest dream killer ever by the more you think about doing things and the less you do things the less results you see your life wasn't built in your head your life is built around your actions well this kind of like i think this this is because of your let's call like um uh a unique mechanism that you're using behind and this is kind of what we'll speak a, a bit on now but i think because of your own personal journey um it helped you kind of like you said, not only transition this into your fitness business, but also um, the other businesses that you had. And then you started to open this up across it. You can see how it is. um, It's got such a, like a a multi-use to it. It's not like mindset only comes under the umbrella of fitness or business or anything. Like it is literally like a pivotal part in anyone's success through any moments of life. So we actually got, um, Alan to come into our community and deliver a um, like it was kind of like a special guest presentation yeah training and um, it was absolutely mind-blowing like it was incredible not only was it incredible feedback from um, our clients inside the academy but even for like myself to sit there and you know, when you get these moments where you actually just have like a moment of clarity. Cause I remember messaging you, messaging you after as well and being like, fuck, like for the first time in my life, I could identify why something had gone wrong because of like a, a single situation that had happened inside the training. Um, I'm not telling you what the training is because you've got to sign up to the Academy to get into the training, but um, no, <laughs> in all seriousness, like I, I want, like, it's, it's something that, you know, people, cause even though you were doing it, for um our clients who are on their fat loss endeavors 
the moment of clarity for me wasn't anything to do with my weight or my fat loss, was it? It was, it was something completely different in my own personal life. But I took the concepts that Alan was talking about to the um, women inside the academy for um, fat loss purposes and packaged it into something else in my life that I'd realized. So without even butchering it even more, like there's kind of talk about a little bit uh, the the strategy of what we're talking about. Like it really is, it really is slightly different. Um, NLP, right? Yeah. Yeah. So NLP, take uh, take the stage. Okay, so NLP, so Neuro Linguistic Programming, uh, everyone goes, what does that even mean? What even is it? It's basically brain language patterns. This is the way to think of it. The most famous person that everyone has known, heard of, watched something of, Tony Robbins. It isn't the only mechanism he uses, but it is one of the mechanisms. And I think he's probably the most famous NLP coach. And that transformation that he'll do with somebody when they're at one of his events, and he'll walk up to them, and he'll stand in front of them, and he'll say certain things in a certain way, and he'll you'll see them touch him in certain places, like on their shoulders, or like all of a sudden you'll see him like swear quite aggressively at them. It's all pre-designed, and it's about creating certain adjustments inside of people the thing that i love about nlp is obviously it provides practical change right? it allows you to get a better understanding of um, your mind and how to take control of it and those type of things but the thing that i really love is a core principle which is everything we need to be successful in life we already have like we already have it in our head like that we just need to understand how to activate it and for somebody who spent a large part of their life thinking they weren't good enough, they were a failure, they were useless, to actually hear, you already have everything you need. You just need to know how to access it. All of a sudden, it makes you start to look at things. It changes that perspective that you go, okay, well, I'm not missing something. I actually have it. I just need to understand it. And I always explain the brain a bit like a jungle. And we always have these paths in our brain that have been cleared. These are the paths that we walk every single day. And that's why our brain can access them very easily. The things for a lot of people that we need to do is we just need to go in there with a strimmer and as a cut some hedge cutters and cut back the paths that we need access to that have just become overgrown. And at that point, it's then about keeping those pathways clear. And this ties all the way back to that thing that I said near the beginning of things that you learn before the age of eight become ingrained. Those pathways, just think of it like they have no trees either side, but like they're never overgrowing. Like they might become a path that we walk a little bit less but we have to understand well, what's the diversion, like what's the pathway that's going to take us around it so that we don't have to use that path. And like NLP for me, like I was quite surprised when I started studying it, how many of the principles I was already using without knowing. And there's lots of things inside of everyday life that we do, especially if we have some kind of success in some area of life that we do without really knowing. So a good example of that would be a, a principle called model mimic and mastery. So this is where you model yourself on, on people to get a certain result. We all do this at a very, very young age when we model our parents. Like we all learn how to be an acceptable human being in the world because we start with our parents and then we find a role model and we start to action and, and copy that behavior. That's well, just simply modeling. But then it's about understanding how can we use that in life? Because Obviously, when people hear, oh, okay, well, I just need to model somebody, well, I'm going to go model Tony Robbins then, or I'm going to go model Cristiano Ronaldo. Well, if you're going to go model those people, they're top 1% of what, at what they do. They are the best of the best of the best. You best be ready for some sacrifice because they sacrificed stuff to, to get where they got to. Cristiano Ronaldo, he doesn't go to bars because he can't. Like, he trains and practices and eats like a very, like a very, very restrictive diet to be the best athlete he possibly can. And if that's not the stuff that you're willing to do, that's the wrong person to model. It's about not just finding the best person. It's about finding the person who is achieving what you want to achieve in life and then modeling around them. So it might already be somebody that you know. And this is where the model mimic and mastery thing becomes so interesting because now it's about finding acceptance with yourself that you're maybe not going to be the top 1% in the world. And if that's your goal to be the very, very best in the world, then cool, go for it. But you have to understand that there's sacrifices that come with it. And it's okay to be top 20%. Like, it still makes you far, 
like higher up the, the scale of things than, than many other people. And it's about modeling the right way. And then over time, you start to develop your own principles around it until you eventually become a master of something. And then you very much have your own thought process around it. Uh, but it takes time. Um, but yeah, NLP is a, a, a great thing to create change inside of your life and, and provide practical solutions to like daily things. So think of how you start every day. Like if you start every day, you press snooze five times, you get up, first thing you drink is a cup of coffee, you moan that it's raining outside, and you're like, oh, God, I've got to work. What have we done? So far, we've overslept, so we're running late, so we're stressed. We've not given our body anything that it actually needs. We've just introduced more caffeine, so like metabolically, like <laughs> cortisol levels are spiking, and we've put negativity out into the world. And people go, oh, negativity and positivity, it's stupid, it doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. Why are the most successful people in the world so positive? Why are they like grateful, if nothing, nothing else? And what we put out into the world, we get back. Like Law of Attraction, it ties into NLP. Mm -hmm. uh, these things, they seem really, let's just be honest, sometimes they seem stupid. Like because we don't understand them. But actually, when we follow those processes, it creates change because we approach the situation with a different perspective. If we wake up and we don't snooze our alarm, there's loads of studies that show that your body comes out of the sleep cycle better because you don't restart another cycle. So now you wake up, give it 60 seconds, 90 seconds, and you start to feel awake. Immediately hydrate yourself. Like you're giving your body what it needs. So now we're starting to form a process, like forming that morning process starts your day strong. Then we're going to put some positive vibes out into the world. So we put some gratitude out into the world. We just give some thanks for anything. We don't have to pray. We don't have to go to a rain dance. We can just say something quietly in our head. <laughs> like we can just say something like, I'm grateful that I woke up again today. Because if you've lost anyone that you love, you know how precious life is like something as simple as that putting a positive vibe out into the world and then simply doing a little bit of stretching you don't have to exercise first thing in the morning but even some simple stretching that two minute process if you do that every day i will guarantee you if you do nothing at the moment you will feel 10 times 15 times better within two to three weeks than if you continue to do nothing and that's the very very tip of what you can start to adjust and all of a sudden, like you start to be able to control your state because this is the real purpose of NLP is being able to control your state, understanding what your brain is doing and be able to take control of it. So that ultimately you can go and you can go from happy to sad or sad to happy or from focused to passionate. Like you learn to be able to control your mind instead of just allowing your mind to just run free like a, um, a crazy person running through a field. Like it's about getting that control and really being able to create those changes. Um, so yeah, I'm a massive fan of, of this kind of stuff. And it's, it's been really pivotal in creating big change in life. I think um, like one of the biggest things about it is as well, and is like what I like about this like unique approach is when you typically think about looking to start any kind of like fat loss endeavor, like the first two initial things that society teaches us is like, right, you now can pretty much no longer eat anything. And secondly, you have to exercise yourself into the ground. And if you don't like exercise at minimum an hour a day, like you're a failure. And if you're eating any kind of sugar or anything like that, you are a failure. Like these are kind of like, even it blows my mind still, like in today's society, that is still a, a thing that people like truly, truly believe is um, the key to success. Whereas like the, because NLP isn't under one umbrella, right? It's not like NLP is this one strategy that you do. Like there's loads of things inside yeah. it, isn't there, that, yeah. that make it up. Um, but it's, it's starting with exactly like you said, it said, instead of being like, right, okay, like you, you now need to um, get up, go work out for an hour in the morning or anything like that. It's like, okay, what's, it's, this is it's very personal, isn't it? It's like, what to you is the best thing that we can do in order to create a positive change mm -hmm. to start off with? You don't need to like completely change your life. You don't need to do all these things. It's like, what is the, what is the problem at the moment? How can we, in the easiest and simplest form create the first step to a positive change from this from this issue that's going on 
And um, yeah, it's uh, it's one of those ones as well where I like I don't want to go into it too much because this is something that like even after our session that you had inside the academy like we could have gone for hours and hours and hours like pulling loads of different things apart and it's just not relevant for this podcast so i don't want to start like put, putting together strategies and whatnot like we'll we'll um put alan's details down below in the show notes for you to be able to reach out to him and and uh, understand but for someone that is maybe like like who would this be perfect for like who would you say like what scenario would you say i think um using NLP is perfect for anyone who, well, well, firstly, anyone, but let's be a bit more specific than anyone. Like, let's just say somebody who is struggling to make any kind of forward progress in any area of life. That's where this can really help to create change because it creates clarity. And I come, I always come back to one sentence, incremental, not monumental. Like it's about making incremental adjustments. And I know that like that's a, a message that you guys talk a lot about. But so often, especially when we think about making a lifestyle change, we think our mindset has to shift so radically. Like the Cristiano Ronaldo example. Like you have people who have never played football in their life, who have never been in a gym, never eaten healthily, never had any interest in that. And they're like, I'm going to go on a health and fitness journey. I'm going to be the next Cristiano Ronaldo. Hmm. No, you're not. Like, yeah. like maybe if you really dedicate the rest of your life to it, but it's okay to not have to be some monumentally different person. People love you for who you are. Mm. So that means you just need to make some incremental adjustments. We just need to, and I, I always think of, I don't know if you guys are old enough because I'm a little bit older than you guys, but do you remember the old high fives with like the equalizers on and you could like slide the little bits up and down? Yeah. yeah. Like to yeah. me, it's always about like going in and just like moving things up a little bit, like move the treble up a little bit, move the bass down a little bit. And it's the same principle with mindset. It's about making incremental adjustments because you are an amazing human being, however you already are. We now just want to bring the best out of you. We don't want to change you. Like, mm-hmm. like this is about remaining and finding the essence. And I find so often, and I, this is definitely where I was and something that I see over and over again, people who have struggled struggle with mindset or tr- struggle to achieve a goal, especially a, a weight goal or a fitness goal, they believe that they're the problem and that they need to change who they are. And you don't. You just need to unlock those pathways that are currently just overcovered. You just need to learn some strategies to be able to take action. Because if you had a camera and you took a photo from here, you're going to get one picture. If you just shift 20 degrees in either direction, and I know people on the podcast can't see, but on on YouTube they can. If you just move 20 degrees in any direction, you now get a different picture. You get a different perspective on the situation. The cameraman didn't change. The camera didn't change. Like just your perspective changed. And that's the same with, there's so many like analogies for it. Glass, half empty, glass, half full. Mm. Like it's, it's about seeing these situations and really understanding that you're not broken. Like you just need to make a couple of adjustments and life can be so radically different. It's unbelievable. And it's these strategies, like the law of attraction was the first one for me, so much so that I have it tattooed on my arm uh, as part of like a half sleeve. Like, And this arm is basically like my life's journey. Like, There's good things, bad things, all kinds of stuff on there. But the law of attraction created such fundamental change in my life. I literally, I read the book, The Secret, and... They say, uh, I think that the law of attraction, a lot of people look at it like I can just wish for something and it will come true. Obviously, you've got to take some actions on it. Like your actions have got to align with your beliefs, which is mm-hmm. where NLP starts to come in. However, I literally finished that book. I kid you not. I shut the book. I'd been with the girl that I'd been with for five years. I went, we're over. <laughs> Get out. And we broke up. And it had been a tough relationship. Uh, on and off for for several years but we both stayed there because misery loved company and we were both in not very great places from a mindset perspective the moment I took action from that moment in my life everything changed like absolutely everything at this point I was already in like fairly good shape so life was in a positive place to a degree and I was moving forward but the radical shift that then happened over the next several years was you couldn't even write it. Like if I'd have sat down and written down every single dream I ever wish would happen, like it, it wouldn't have 
it been half of, of what it actually is. And I think that's where mindset becomes so pivotal and using things like NLP and, and actually just sometimes having the belief to take the action because fear holds us back, doesn't it? Like the fear of failure. Well, if I believe in something and it doesn't work, I'm going to look stupid. But what if it works? Mm. Like, that's the question. Let's, uh, sorry, this is completely um completely off topic but i did exactly the same to uh, my girlfriend uh, today because we were talking about this right at the beginning i was telling you about like the body rentals and stuff like that and she was like oh well like what should we should we book it now like just in case like um you know something maybe happens or we can't afford to do it or anything like this and i was like how about we look at it from the other perspective of like what happens if we we need to get a bigger villa what happens if we come into loads of money and we need to get a bigger villa and it's like having that perspective isn't it instead of being like everyone always thinks like what's the worst case scenario being like what's the best case scenario yeah. right? and, and you look at everything completely different and you start to act very differently now because you look at it differently um and it's the same with your your um Someone's, weight loss journey there was a i was listening to a I always watch like motivational YouTubes and they were like, what's the best piece, best piece of advice that you could ever give some. And it was like, imagine if it turns out better than you ever believed it could be. Yeah. Mm. And it's so true. And I think that's what holds so many of us back because of that worry of the failing. And it's like, but failing is the best thing that can happen because you got two choices. You can either live with the fear of like rejection where it doesn't work and you get rejected for the idea or just live with the fear of regret, regret that you never know if, if, what, when, do you know what I mean? Like I'd rather have tried it. It didn't work than to spend the rest of my life being like, what if I did that? Imagine how my life would be different right now. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Think of all the successful people in the world. Think of Michael Jordan. I don't know if you've watched any of the, the Netflix documentary that he's in. Watched it all, binged it, loved oh, it. Did you? I've got a few left, but I think that's one of the things like he talks about, he failed far more than he ever succeeded and it's the same with anyone who is the very best at what they do. They just see failure as part of the process. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, um, an interesting thing, isn't it? If you look at it, what is driving them? Is it happiness? Is it what? And it's, it's not happiness. It's joy. They love the process. They find mm -hmm. joy in the process because happiness is cause and effect. I'll be happy when I lose 100 pounds. I never said that to myself ever. I fell in love with the process eventually. I found a way to find a process that I loved. And I found joy in it. The moment you find joy in your process and you stop looking for happiness, because happiness, you're always tying it to a result. Joy mm. is just enjoying the moment, enjoying the process, enjoying what you're doing, being present like every day, understanding what do I need to do today? Everyone who is elite, they have joy for what they do. Like whether it's business, whether they're the best husband in the world, the best parent in the world, the best sports person in the world, they love the process. Doesn't mean there's going to be bad days. Of course, there's going to be bad days. But it means that they wake up every day. They can't wait to get started with the process. And they know what they've got to do today. You can control in the moment. And you have to have belief that the result will come. Yeah, it's so true. Yeah, I love that. So if you were to kind of pull out any any final words, we'll keep it along the theme of obviously the podcast for uh, weight loss purposes. Like what would be some uh, like tips or a tip maybe that you would give someone on their fat loss journey based upon everything? Because I mean, obviously you lost a tremendous amount of weight. Um, like what would you let someone know? And especially for someone like Link Insight, the NLP as well, that is on that journey of being like, oh, you know, I lose five pounds, but then I regain it all back again. And I keep doing that. And I've done that for the last 30 years. Like what would your piece of advice be to them? My piece of advice would be twofold. You need a morning and an evening process and you need um, to check in with yourself. And I think mm -hmm. you need to hold yourself accountable. So the morning process it can be as simple as, as what we spoke about at the beginning, but over time, this needs to become something that's yours. It needs to become a process that empowers you to start your day. It can include working out. It, it doesn't have to, but like my morning process is fundamental to my success. My evening process is also fundamental to my success because it allows me to get clarity on the day. You might have had a stressful for anyone who has got children, like that 6 to 7 p.m. window, especially if they're young kids, is a nightmare like it's 
like bath time, dinner time, kids are tired, they start screaming and shouting, you feel stressed, you could have had quite a good day, that moment comes around and you feel like your day sucks. Like if one of the kids starts kicking off, they go to bed a bit upset or whatever, having an evening process where you review what you've done for the day and you actually write down your successes for the day, the successes of your weight loss journey. Did you manage to eat the right food today? Did you manage to work out? Did you manage to use your process to overcome emotional eating today? Actually write them down because our brain will remember it. That will change your perspective. And you'll wake up the next day ready to go again. That morning and evening process keeps you anchored at both points of the day. And then checking in with yourself. I have a really rigorous process that I will, like a, um, a manager um, reviewing somebody who's an employee, I'll give myself a monthly review. Like, how am I getting on? Uh, how are things going in my life? What worked for me this month? What didn't work for me this month? And I do it more as a whole life thing now. But if you're really focusing on just a weight loss journey, remember incremental. You don't have to create massive change. This was built over years. Just focus on your weight loss side of it for now. How is it going? What worked well for you this month? What didn't work well this month? And then what are the action steps that you're going to take next month to correct some of these things or to try something different because that way we're now not procrastinating on it of oh well this month's been terrible it just never works well i'll just try and do the same thing again next month well how are you going to get a different result if you do the same thing over and over again it's the definition of insanity if you expect a different result so it's about understanding and having a clear process to create change tracking is fundamental to that but you have to have information can't just guess like reviews on a never based think of the last time you had a performance review in a job did your manager sit down and go i feel like you're not doing a very good job well, you're gonna go well what's that based on when you end up in a tribunal because they fired you because he feels you're not doing a good job there has to be data behind it so well, you don't measure <laughs> yeah exactly like you've got to have like, measurements you've got to understand like how's your weight going what are your measurements what's your food like like and if you're a, a, a woman, like, where are you at? Like, how is your month going? Like, my wife, she obviously goes through a monthly cycle. I consider moving out at certain points in the month. <laughs> because I've got three daughters. Right. So it's like, like, it's one of those things you have to track. Where are you at? Because those type of things are going to play into how you feel. Mm -hmm. That's subjective, isn't it? So... They, yeah. Those would be my bits of advice. Create a process, have a morning and evening process and check in with yourself uh, on a monthly basis. Yeah, I love that. Definitely aligns with, with our ethos, doesn't it, and everything. So spot on. Um, so where can, where can people find you, Alan? Where can people find you? So they can find me on the internet, uh, <laughs> alanmiles.com. Uh, they can find me on Facebook, facebook.com slash alanmiles. Uh, they can find me on Instagram, uh, Alan Miles Coaching, and they can find me on TikTok. Can't remember what that one is. I think it's Alan Miles Eight, something like that. Maybe I've just given Alan Miles Eight low, yeah, a couple yeah, more followers. Yeah, plug. <laughs> my, my, my profile picture is the same on all of them. Yeah. Uh, I look very happy with a green background behind me, wearing a white top. Uh, Alan is spelled A W -L, L A N. One day, Hayden and Ryan will learn how to spell my name correctly. Yeah, you spelled um, wrong, mate. <laughs> Never. Never. Uh, so alanmiles.com um and that's the best place to get hold of all of my links everything is there um and feel free to say hello if you ever see me wandering around in the street uh, i'll probably be off in my own world but always approachable if anyone ever sees me yeah if um if obviously you don't want to take the chance of trying to re reach out to a random man and you feel like you've got it wrong or something just What's drop position? either myself or ryan yeah we'll drop we'll drop the links anyway but uh you can always drop um myself and ryan a little message and we can hook you up or um like if you want to learn a little bit more about like this nlp strategy and you feel like you are currently like you just keep hitting the same roadblock and you can't seem to get over it um drop either alan or myself and ryan a message just saying nlp and um we'll hook you up with some more information of how we can help you overcome it Appreciate it, guys. Thank you very much. That's right, man. It's been a pleasure. I was, I was intrigued. Literally, just it was. I haven't even said much this podcast as so I was just listening to everything you were saying. It was really interesting because I missed the training inside the group. So this was really kind of interesting for me to hear more about it as well. So no, I thoroughly enjoyed it. That's I was good. Like a listener. <laughs> 
Yeah, like we literally like scratched the surface. Well, Alan scratched the surface with like what we kind of went in. I definitely want to like hundred percent like go back into the group and watch it. But like, yeah. it's it's good. It is really good. Um, cool. Right, we'll wrap this up. And um, if uh, I was going to say, did you have any final thoughts? But you kind of like wrapped it up perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I don't think I, I have any final thoughts. I think the one thing I would say to anyone who's on a weight loss journey, like believe in yourself. I think that's the biggest yeah. thing, like t- looking at it from the other side of the fence. And it's it can be hard sometimes when coaches and PTs and stuff are like, oh, you can do it, you can do it. And sometimes it feels like they just, they just don't get it because they maybe have never been out of shape. Mm-hmm. But from somebody who has been in that other place, you have to believe that you can because – it, and it, I know it ties back to mindset, but if you believe you can, then you absolutely can. If you believe you can't, then you won't. Like yeah. it really is, is that simple. So that self-belief is important. Um, and that comes in loads of different ways, but yeah, you absolutely can. And you've already got all the tools you need. You just need to move forward. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, well, mate, thanks so much for coming on and, um, we'll wrap this up and, uh, thank you everyone for uh, listening, watching, depending on, obviously what platform you're doing it on and we'll catch you for another episode next week have an amazing monday bye-bye see you later guys Bye. bye